right. Um, so before starting, I just want to uh, let the attendees know that this panel discussion is going to be an interactive. We really want to be an interactive conversation and uh, hear your uh, your questions, like what is on your mind? What do you really want to learn from this panel? So that's why we have uh, put this QR uh, that goes to uh, a dashboard where you can ask questions and vote for the ones that you feel are more relevant to you. I will, uh, maybe if there are a lot of questions, we won't be able to go to all of them, but we will make sure to track all those that are with, that has more, more votes. So um, I just want to make sure that it's working before getting it started. So if someone can do like a test in the dashboard and so I can see if it's working or not. Yeah, 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 I say thank you so much, whoever um, added. I just want to take a picture of people. People are taking pictures. Yeah. It, can I take a picture? Smile. Thank you. All right, then with that, okay, thank you. Thank you so much for the test questions. <laughs> I say it right now. So, so we get it started? All right, so thank you so much for joining our panel on the automotive open source from Office. So we have with here great open source uh, managers, leaders, ambassadors in organizations from uh, different uh, companies across this automotive industry. So I would like you to do a sort intro uh, before getting started with the questions. So who wants to go first? Okay, now you give pressure on me. <laughs> the first one is surely. Okay. Um, my name is Mary Wang. I'm a director of open source ecosystem for Volvo Cars. Um, I prepared a joke for today, in fact. And unfortunately, I used it up in my last panel. <laughs> Let's do it again. You want to hear it again? If you were, yeah. yeah, if you want to hear again, uh, you can watch the YouTube later. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm from uh, Volvo Car and I'm based in Sweden. So I'm quite uh, feel uncommon for the sunny weather here. <laughs> I'm used to rain. You know. <laughs> um, yeah, I come from engineer part and uh, working on the open source for the open source council internally and uh, we have formed the Ospon in for two years now so far so it's still kind of a baby and i'm here learn and share keep on exploring yeah so that's me okay yeah uh, beforehand i have one thing uh, my linkedin told me uh, yesterday is uh, anna's birthday oh. yeah <laughs> And the congratulations to the group's anniversary. Yeah. This is Pokemon cake. Yeah, from Japan. Yeah. So uh, I'm Masato Endo uh, from Toyota Motor Corporation. I'm a manager of the software development in Toyota. And I also uh, manager of the OSPO of Toyota. And uh, I'm engaged in the many community works, like uh, Open Chain as a board member and uh, uh, automotive chair. And uh, recently, I became the uh, evangelist uh, in Japan uh, of Linux Foundation. And I also engaged in the uh, 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 OIN and so on, and uh, AGL also. Yeah, so nice to meet you. Thank you. So, uh, hello, my name is Wolfgang Gehring. I'm a FOSS ambassador and OSPO lead at Mercedes-Benz Tech Innovation based in Germany. And uh, we've been working with open source for quite a few years now. Still learning, obviously, because that's, that's the beauty of open source, right? Collaborating, learning from each other. And uh, that's why we're here. And uh, thanks for, the, for joining the panel, everybody. And thanks for organizing, Anna. Thank you. So uh, before getting started with the audience questions that we, we are starting to get a lot, I feel like the first introductory questions uh, to set the crown is why having an OSPO is important for your company and for the automotive industry based on your experience? 
Okay, I'll just start, yeah? So why is it important to have an OSPO for our company? So the thing is, we started doing open source quite a long time ago, but everybody was kind of in getting engaged in open source and we weren't really supposed to, but you know, you kind of start interacting and learning and, and doing things. But if in a big company, every division somehow is doing somehow open source, you know, you're not doing it in a concerted and organized fashion that invites a lot of risks in, into your company. Uh, that are associated with open source and you're also not getting the full value because you're not coordinating with everybody else and so that's why i think it's absolutely essential to have an open source uh, office in in a big company there are still companies of course that say yeah we don't do open source but they're probably just in denial to be really honest right because i think software development these days is just not possible without open source anymore so better to realize you are doing open source and to get the most benefit from it is by having an OSPO. Very good answer. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> from my aspects, uh, why we form OSPO in our company, um, since you haven't formed it for decades, why you form it now, as we know, like in the infotainment system today, 90% of the code is Bad of open source. So compliance is one part. And of course, you use a lot of open source, you do this upstream, you do the contribution and the collaboration. So from one, from one aspect, it's like a governance. In a big company, you need a governance organization to own the responsibility, to own this clear border with IP, with engineering or R&D, with purchase, etc. So by not having an Osborn, it may it will make this work quite challengeable. Uh, I think uh, software in our industry become important day by day, and uh, of course, open source is also very important. And uh, on the other hand, our industry is very traditional. So uh, if uh, some engineer want to use or contribute to open source, some barriers exist inside the company or outside. So uh, we'd like to uh, create the barrier and uh, to support the engineers is our mission. And uh, our uh, industry is, uh, is uh, very big and uh, all, almost software is coming from the suppliers. So at the same time, uh, supply chain management is very important in our industry uh, of open source software also. So well, uh, this is uh, the characteristic of our industry. So we're going to start with the, with, the with the audience questions. Uh, the first top one is related to how does the upper management, how, how do you get the upper management to sign off uh, open source activities or, uh, uh, yeah, like initiative, like for instance, the open source manifesto, like how, how do you get that? Uh, get uh, buy-in by, by management and, and approve and leverage on a company level. Okay, um, so how do you convince management? Basically, you, you have to show them, you have to show them the value of open source. You have to make it clear to them that you cannot develop software anymore these days without open source. I think that's Okay, I'm preaching to the choir. Everybody is like, duh, but not everybody outside of software development knows this. So you have to show them, look, 86% of the code in our industry consists of open source of, of, in a software project. Yeah, 100% of software development projects use open source somewhere in their development. That's the finding from the latest uh, study from the you know Synopsys open source open source security risk analysis report from last year. Uh, they divide it into industries. So I, I, if I'm not mistaken, 86% was the automotive industry. So, and then you show them if we don't do it, like really do it with an OSPO, you're also inviting a lot of risks and they can have grave consequences. So at this point, I think everybody should agree. Okay. Plus you can use it to influence sectors of your industry. For example, in the car industry, you know, software defined vehicle, you're either there or you're not. 
And if you're not there, you're not participating. So that's another reason why to have an OSPO is good, right? And so open source manifesto you mentioned. Um, so we published that in 2018. And this is a public commitment to say, yes, we believe in open source. We will our, allow our engineers to participate in open source. And we will give them the time to, and actually we don't just allow it, we will send them on that mission actively. Please be there in open source. And uh, that hopefully should be convincing. <laughs> James Levy is like, yeah, come on. I just love the hopefully, Will. <laughs> <laughs> the doubt here. <laughs> Sorry, no doubt. <laughs> Yes, I think um, most of the company have their open source manifesto, like Mercedes-Benz, for example. It's open and in their website, and I have watched it for a while. <laughs> so we have similar internally as well, so both for managers and for engineers. For managers, how you convince them, how you make them buy in. For the engineering, how you support them, both from uh, the practical implement implementation type um, work, etc. Um, I think it's it's very important to have this manifesto in place. It's a uh, attitude and it's a uh, kind of company's vision. Or and also you use this to interact with your software strategy, for example, how make people realize or that software, not only like close your door to make it by yourself or just like before you buy it from a supplier. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, of course, uh, we have uh, open source policy, inside the policy, and uh, uh, I drafted uh, five, six years ago. And But uh, uh, last week, I, uh, uh, Uru uh told me about the open source manifest, and uh, I think uh, uh, that is very good because it is not only for inside the company, but also this is uh, uh, in public. So I think that means not only for one company, but also our in uh, other industry companies also aware of the importance of the open source, and uh, our suppliers and vendors also I think so. Uh, so I think uh, uh, manifest is a very uh, useful tool and the communication uh, channel uh, of each company. We've got another question about internal culture. So it's they're asking if is inner source also part of your work as an OSPO? Uh, our company's OSPO is uh, set up uh, this January. So uh, we not uh, do the many inner source works, but of course uh, we already do the some inner source uh, project, and uh, uh, we discuss and uh, we like to uh, support uh, them. So uh, the answer is uh, yes. Yes, the inspo, inspo, inspo. Yes, inspo and inspo. Some company merge them together, some are separate. In our case, it's like we support the INSPO, but we don't own INSPO. Yeah, so uh, as she said, uh, some companies have separate ISPOs and OSPOs. I think the majority would have it together. And in our case, it's also like, so our OSPO or our center of competence also takes care of inner source. Mm -hmm. Very important as well to have that, I think. Um, another question we have, um, so what percentage of activities overseen by the OSPO involve leverage open source innovation and what percentage covers upstream contributions? So, so, where is, so what's the percentage? Yeah, I think it's in terms of hours spent working on one activity versus another. And I. It might be like a mix, like one is OSPO involved leverage in open source innovation and um, doing like education on upstream contribution, I guess. If someone who's wrote this question wants to better explain this question, you can raise, okay. So every OSPO has this uh, challenge of justifying their activities. And you might have people asking like, why do you have so many engineers contributing code back to upstream? We are paying their salaries. But at the same time, we, there are 
technologies that you are leveraging from the community back into commercial products, let's say. So I was wondering your activities, how much time do you spend on upstream contribution and how many activities or percentage you spend on getting stuff from downstream into commercial products? Okay, understand the question, I think. Um, I have no idea. We, so we don't, we don't actually measure it, right? Estimate, it's, it's a part of an engineer's job to you know, leverage, to use it, but also we tell them, please, if you find a bug, you know, make an upstream contribution. If you need a new feature, make an upstream issue request maybe, or implement something yourself and contribute it back. But I really have no idea how. So it, in general, engineers tend to be interacting with the open source community. But I, as a matter of fact, though, um, we have set up a project to find out how much people are spending outside of their project with other open source projects. But I don't have the numbers yet. OK, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I think for the upstreaming, it's basically a count to the development work because that is for product as well. And what you do so is to reduce the maintenance, the continuously rebase. If you don't do so, your engineering work will be take more, even more longer time. So for extra, like if it's not, not product related, that may be needed to kind of calculate how, how much time we're working on this open source community, etc. Uh, in this period, uh, our OSP and our open source activity is an initial stage. So it is very difficult to define that. So uh, we now promote, promote, promote. So it, no limit. But uh, every uh, boss of the, each division is, uh, has a, uh, gives many tasks, uh, not only for open source tasks. So well, we support it, uh, is our situation. Um, there is a question around challenges. What would you see your biggest challenges in your role for the next two, three years? I know it's, you need to process this because it's like, okay, how do I see myself in the next two, three years? Okay, I'll start, yeah. Okay, so, um, we're very good at using open source. That's the easy part, right? <laughs> well, I mean, you still need to deal with all the licenses, you need to educate your engineers and so forth. Okay, but that's done. Um, we also encourage our engineers to contribute back upstream and to publish stuff of our own as open source. And uh, we're getting better and better at more and more contributions. But I have to admit, the number of open source projects that we publish could be more. And uh, so this, but it, it's a process that takes years, you know, first you have to get it into the mindset to think open source first. And I think in the engineering departments, we're, I think we're pretty good at that. But if we have published stuff of our own. You can look at our website, open source, mercedesbenz.com. Uh, you'll find projects, um, but there could be more. And uh, there will be more because we're incentivizing more and more. And maybe we'll have a big project next year. I don't want to announce it because if it's not working out, then you, okay. But uh, I am very, um, very uh, uh, confident and, and positive. But that's, I think that's a challenge because we want to contribute more as publishing our open source. You know? Now I think it's so great to sit in the middle. While he talks, I can think. <laughs> um, for the challenges we have today, I think it's um, by standing on all of the giant's shoulder, we have kind of a lot of uh, benefit or advantage to make things done, make this all of the fundamental uh, fundamental work and uh, doing this implementation, etc. But what is the challenges in two or three years? I think it's very easy for me. What they are suffering today, maybe is what we will suffer tomorrow. Uh, I think most big challenges are change the culture, uh, traditional culture to the open source culture. And uh, not only uh, for our company, but also uh, 
uh, Japanese companies also and the automotive companies also. Uh, so I think it takes time, but uh, uh, two, three years later, uh, I think uh, numbers also in our industry and the Japanese companies uh, become double is uh, my target. Yeah. Yes, uh, I, I have one more. <laughs> So I think for the challenge for me, or at least I feel like how you bring the business value to your company in the business aspects more than in the door, like the implementation or automation or et cetera. So how you can make sure what you are doing now is not just cost the company's money, but bring the money back, use a data-driven, transparent way or model. So. <laughs> so the next question is about licenses. So they're asking, what do you see, uh, like how, how do you handle liabilities, not, yeah, liabilities for the cars using open source? And they, they put an example of the GPL license that says software delivers as it is, like what are the processes or are there any directions on how in your company you address these licenses? Okay, I can start. Um, in vehicle, uh, there's band license three, three band license. So like no GPL V3, for example. But for all other restricted license, uh, we have a kind of strict process to handle that. I think all the company do that to integrate this policy into your scanning tool and to integrate this policy into your CI continuous integration chain. Depends on if this vehicle is related or not. If it's this product or software will be used in the vehicle and the services. If you, it's detected it's the forbidden license, sorry, your CI chain will be broken. It's interrupted automatically. <clears throat> Yeah, for permissive one, it's quite okay because it, it's not a big deal in this case. Mm. Uh, I think uh, license uh, is an uh, intention of the each engineers. So it is very important to respect that. So uh, I, uh, every time uh, to uh, inform that, uh, very basic things. And of course, uh, I think risks of the license is uh, uh, different from uh, each use case and the scale of using. So uh, we, uh, I think, uh, to tell the uh, very simple policy is has a risk because the misunderstandings happen. So we'd like to uh, inform the basic uh, philosophy and uh, to discuss uh, in detail of the uh, each use case. Yeah, so basically what both of you said, um, software that goes into the vehicle is looked at very, very carefully and licenses are evaluated. We evaluate all the licenses and permissive ones are okay and restrictive ones, you know, take care, be careful and no copy left in the, inside the vehicle and so forth. Yeah, I think it makes sense. Yeah. Huh? Hello. Uh, my question is on the embedded technologies. Generally, you cannot get rid of uh, GPL license. Even if you take a vehicle, every electronic control unit will definitely have a GPL component. So how exactly you are managing your proprietary code as well as GPL inside the ECUs? Yeah, uh, so uh, you're right. GPL is can divide GPL with two or three, right? Three is banned in our company's uh, vehicle's policy, but two is not. So two is fine. We just uh, follow what the GPL V2 requirement and uh, fulfill the license compliance for each. So you're right. The many GP, uh, GPL V2 uh, open source, including ECUs, all suppliers, all ourselves. Yeah. But once you are Doing this correct for this open source license compliance, following this open chain standard, that's no problem. Uh, I think uh, to disclose source code is not usual uh, risks, but uh, I think, uh, uh, for example, uh, Linux is a GPL2, and uh, we use uh, Linux inside the vehicle. 
So uh, to uh, handle the appropriate manner uh, is very important things. So uh, not afraid is very important thing. <laughs> Another question about uh, lowering the entry barrier. Uh, so how, how do you and your organization lower this entry barrier for open source usage and for open source contributions? Are there any best practices? Uh, lower the barrier for... For both, for usage and then contributions. Yeah, okay, so we have developed a set of trainings for our people that they like so the first level is FOSS awareness that's basically for everybody like to make to understand what is open source and why it is okay to share uh, and then the second one is a, a use training and so everybody every engineer who uses open source in their software development which means everybody they have to do this training and it just gives them an overview of what they should do, what they shouldn't do, what they're not allowed to do and how to handle it. And, and the training is actually really nice. And uh, uh, we, we even won an, an e-learning award for it. Yeah. And uh, so that's, I think that lowers the barrier because at first people are like, okay, what do I need to do? Whatever. Do the training that should answer all the questions. If you still have questions, you can approach us and we'll help you. And we have another training for contribution and another training for publication. Yeah, and so that also should lower the barrier, I think, and help them to do it in a compliant way. Um, I think we lower the barrier from the efficiency way. For example, when, when engineers request open source with GPLv2, how fast you can give them the answer, yes or no, or approve or not. For the contribution part, it's the same, like focus on these three areas, the project itself, and then for the compliance part, and then you need to have the legal people or patent people in place. So instead of previously, before we formed OSPON, one open source contribution project maybe take one month or even more. But now after the OSPON is, fo is formed, and uh, align with the legal people, patent people together. So once we have an open source contribution project request in a week, so basically, in a week, it will be published in GitHub. Uh, we prepare uh, every uh, educational materials for uh, every needs. Uh, for example, I think uh, uh, education of the open source is not only for engineers, but also, for example, uh, salespeople uh, may making the uh, smartphone application or uh, purchase department uh, make the contract about open source with uh, uh, vendors, sales people. So I think that, so initial basic level uh, education is needed for all employees. Uh, fortunately, uh, our, com our country is uh, animation and comic is very popular. So we uh, make the uh, e-learning tool uh, using the comics. So everyone can read uh, very easily and to understand uh, well. So, but of course, uh, for engineer, uh, engineers' materials, is a very uh, uh, detailed process is uh, exists. Uh, so we we uh, change the uh, approach uh, from uh, 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 to for each need. Uh, this is our uh, strategy. Yeah. So I saw the trainings. I saw the comics uh, Masato-san showed me, and it, it's really cool. Really nice Japanese style comic. Everybody can re what, read. What, it was in Japanese. I couldn't read. But, uh. yeah. so <laughs> no, but it was nice. I'd like to uh, translate to English, and uh, if it's possible, I'd like to disclose. But uh, the uh, the material holder is uh, IP division, so tough negotiation. Yeah. <laughs> The, the training material you're talking about, do you provide them under an open source license or something that can be reused by? Uh... Yeah, that, so that would be very nice. Uh, no, unfortunately not yet. Uh, 
Um, I have to say some of these trainings are, you know, Mercedes specific, company specific things. So they wouldn't be all that interesting uh, for, for outside of the company. But the general idea and the general thing, I would actually kind of like to, to have that published, but uh, we haven't gotten around to doing that yet. But uh, we have thought about it and the inner, we have an inner source training as well. That might be quite interesting. But uh, so, yeah, it's uh, on the list. Sorry, hopefully, hopefully we can do it. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Well, I can also yeah. So then we are so generous. We will publish our open source training material soon. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we generally have three type of uh, training course. So the first one is a very uh, simple short video, open source video, which is made by me and the two head of engineering, which is published to all white colors, uh, 30k thousand employees. The second one is the focus on this engineering and the leadership. So this is type one. The other one is uh, electric, sorry, e-learning course. So you do not need teacher there, but it's in the system. Um, what we are trying to make it as open source um, probably will be open source the engineering one. Yeah. Okay, because there is another question in terms of uh, setup. So they're asking how many uh, people and with which qualifications are in your OSPO. Uh, I know this might be tricky because sometimes it's not like directly in the OSPO, but it's more like um, distributed matrix of experts. But if you can get a glance on like top qualifications of these open source uh, matrix box experts that are working in the OSPO or really close to the OSPO to the audience. Okay, so the I think the most important skill sets are techies. Obviously, it's a technical topic. You need IT techie guys in there. Then uh, we have community management because a lot of times that is overlooked, but. Uh, uh, oh, one of my community managers is right here and she's smiling. She's like, thank you for mentioning it. <laughs> very important because, you know, a lot of times engineers are very good at coding, but they're not so good at community management. And they think, hey, if I publish my code and it's good, it, everybody will automatically find out about it and use it. And obviously that's not the case. So you need community management. Very important as well. You need legal and governance because they're the ones who understand uh, all the, the legal, legalese stuff <laughs> and uh, the licenses and all that. And that's very essential as well, right? So I think th this, is, this is a skill set, I think, that could be typical, but uh, of course, according to your company, uh, could be different as well. Yes, uh, I think it's quite different between companies and companies. But basically, you focus on either consumption part, contribution part, or collaboration part, or you focus on when people is responsible for everything, but then you divide the system architecture or developer, which is focused on the automation and the implementation or tool analyzation, etc. So in our case, it's like covering both, I would say. It's not, we don't have so much clearly divided this responsibility, but working as a whole team. Um, because the team is so small, you can shift um, the focus on each period, but it, it's feel like if you separate two kind of standalone, it, it will miss the um, teamwork. So we are kind of like shift each, each period. Like this period, we would like working on, let's say, fulfill the open chain conformal program. Okay, let's work on this project this three months or this half a year like that. Yeah, uh, I think uh, skill is important, but most important thing is a uh, mindset and passion uh, for open source uh, activities. Because uh, in big companies, uh, almost all infrastructures exist, so and, uh, everyone can work inside the company. But uh, open source workers have to communicate with uh, community and other companies' people. This is very uh, different skill set and uh, uh, mindset is import, uh, needed. So, and uh, this is, it, uh, it is very important for the passion to continue that. Uh, this is my opinion. Uh, you mentioned that most of your code is coming from suppliers like tier one or tier two, like, uh, so do you have any 
process defined like whose responsibility is it you do you expect as a criteria in deciding the supplier that they need to have an ospo office within them organization or that's not an important criteria and the second question was uh, i think most of your suppliers will share the code in a form of binaries where you don't have an access to the source code uh, my question is why do you need technical people in automotive industry in ospo divisions I understand you need to have e-learning and other things to educate people. But when it comes to review, why do you need technical guys in automation industry? I can answer first. Uh, this is a good question. I think this is um, maybe if you look back to 10 years ago, maybe it's like that. But today, the transformation happens. It's not only focused on the supplier. The in-house software development is a lot. So basically, if you look at this uh, core platform or this infotainment system, the connectivity department is a huge engineer there. So that's why we need all of the technical support, not only for supplier, but most of ourselves, in-house team as well. For the requirement to the supplier, um, that is very important. Clear, clarify the responsibility, and if your legal department are even more strict, you probably will clarify what is the consequence will be if you break, breach some license compliance, etc. Of course, uh, supply chain management of the software uh, have the, some rules uh, defined by the uh, contract or guideline. Uh, this is uh, everyone, not only uh, tier, uh, tier one supplier but also we have to follow that. And uh, but uh, expectation for OSPO is exist, but I think uh, uh, Anasan says uh, OSPO is, uh, not, my OSPO is not your OSPO. So I think uh, to think what is the best OSPO uh, in each company is most important things. So I think uh, to promote that is very important, but uh, not define that as a uh, company's OSPO. So there is another question, but I might phrase it wrong. So please, the person that uh, asked this, if they want to elaborate more. So there is a question on what is your, um, what is your process in long-term support and maintenance from this Star One or Silicon Linux provider? Like, what is the, yeah, like the process you follow to provide this support and maintenance? Is that right? I don't know who asked this question. So the question was long-term support and maintenance for Tier 1 or Silicon Linux provider. Example, the Cyber Resiliency Act. Okay. Uh. The question are more related to CRI, CRA and uh, there's a new regulation regarding long-term support and uh, obligation that the uh, supplier of the software uh, must have like uh, software breakability uh, CVEs and so on. And this uh, imply um, maintenance and forth from the OEM, but also maybe from other suppliers like Tire One or Silicon providers. So how do we see this progressing uh, from open source perspective? Okay, so if I understand the question correctly, the CRA has been, you know, passed just very recently. We have now three years to implement the requirements, and a lot of the requirements are not clear yet exactly what they mean. There are like 40-some regulations that need to be uh, worked out in more detail, and that's exactly what's, what's, what's now being worked on. So the Eclipse Foundation has, um, well, it's about 15 or so, Florent, correct me? Uh, foundations that have now come together under the roof of the Eclipse Foundation to, um, and very soon the Open Regulatory Compliance Working Group will be officially announced and founded. And that is the purpose of this working group to work on, to help with the European Commission, the other foundations and some industry players to work on, work out exactly what these regulations mean. Okay, and so right now I can't answer the question really, but there, I mean, the whole CRA will change the way software is being developed. Like 
not just in automotive, like across the software industry, right? And and so, yeah, we'll see. There is a oh, follow-up question. Okay. Ah, okay. Uh, repeat again. So, uh, one uh, notice, uh, uh, small notice. Uh, three years you have for current products. Uh, for new products, you have not such delay. You must implement CRA immediately. So, now I have to uh, make the disclaimer I'm not a lawyer. Oh, here is one. But. Uh, um, <laughs> I think you know, CRA immediately is not possible because the regulation is not clear exactly what it means. You want to say something to that? Yeah. Uh, just for clarity, according to Article 57.2, it'll be enforceable three years after enactment, so February 2027. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you, Shane. So, yeah. All right, and we're already out of time, so we're going to do like a wrap up uh, 30 seconds on your summary, your remarks on this uh, panel session before wrapping up. Yeah, so I'm very happy coming to Europe uh, after COVID, and uh, I'm uh, very happy to discuss with uh, 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 automotive friends, and uh, I uh, realized that uh, same issues happened all over the world. So I'd like to uh, continue the discussion and uh, to uh, share the best practice is very important things. So I'd like to continue that. Thanks so much. A great summary. <laughs> um, I think it's simple for me. Um, keep on exploring and uh, keep on learning from our peers and uh, keep on sharing with all of you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. So, I mean, first of all, thank you for being here. I, I think it's really great that we have such a, a, a nice crowd here. And the, the thing is, you know, let's go back 10 years. You know, it was very difficult to talk to your industry peers. You know, Mercedes sitting at the table with BMW <gasps> or with, you know, other manufacturers and, and Volvo and Toyota, you know, it was like, <gasps> be careful. Now, we still have to be careful, you know, don't, don't get me wrong, there, there still are the restrictions of uh, uh, trust and, and so forth, yeah, but open source, about open source, we can talk openly, and I think that is the beauty, you know, it brings people together, so we can talk about the public stuff, open stuff with everyone and with our peers, and I think that's the beauty of open source, so thanks. And also with that, I want to say that all the questions that were not able to be answered here, we are trying to put together like a blog summary. So um, this is gonna, this is recorded, but also having a, a, a blog summary with all these questions so everyone can have access to it. And uh, you can also track like, okay, what, what were the key points that I missed from, from this conversation? So just to let you know that even though it hasn't been able to be answered here in public, we will try our best to have it uh, in, in the shape of a blog post in the following weeks or months, depending. We are open source community. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, thank you so much. And thank you so much for your insights and being here with us. Thank you. Thank you.